In this presentation, we outline the proofs behind Lamé's equations as used in the analysis of thick cylinders. The proofs outlined are found in most mechanical principles textbooks, but are worked through in a little more detail in certain places. Please note there's a separate presentation on application of Lamé's equations to solve thick cylinder problems. Let's consider the proof of Lamé's equation. So consider a cylinder which is long in comparison to its diameter. Assume the longitudinal stresses and the strains are constant across the wall thickness of the cylinder. Consider an element of the cylinder wall shown in figure one. This is the element here of the cylinder wall. It's blown up here. When the cylinder is subject to internal and external pressure and where the axial length, the length here, is unity. So here's our situation. We have an internal pressure PI and an external pressure PO. We're considering a small elemental strip of the cylinder wall here that's shown up here. And we've got some stresses applied to the wall. We've got in the radial direction on the inside surface, we have the radial stress. And then a distance dr further out, we have the radial stress plus the slight change in radial stress. And d sigma r is indicating a very small change in radial stress. We also have the hoop stress on either side of this element. The element spans over an angle of d theta. And we know the inside radius of the element and we know the thickness of the element, delta L. So let's now consider the radial equilibrium of the forces. What we're going to do now is develop an equation by considering the radial equilibrium of the forces applied. Here's a two-dimensional picture of our element. This is to our element here. And in the radial direction, we have the sigma r on the inside surface of the element and sigma r plus d sigma r on the outside surface of the element. And here's our hoop stress in the cylinder wall. What we're going to do now is resolve forces into the vertical sense, into the radial sense here. So on the next slide, we'll generate an equation considering the force generated by the inside radial stress on the element and the outside radial stress on the element. And we'll also consider the force from the vertical component of the hoop stress in this vertical sense. Just notice our geometry here. The small elemental segment spans d theta, so half of d theta is d theta upon 2, and that's the angle shown here when we're resolving our hoop stresses into the vertical sense. The proof of Lama's equation. Let's now consider summation of the vertical forces. They must equal to 0 for equilibrium, so upwards is positive here. But in the proof below, we'll make use of radian measure. Don't forget the arc length in radian measure. S is the radius multiplied by the angle, the angle in terms of radians, of course. So to calculate, first of all, the force associated with the outside radial stress on the element, that's sigma r plus d sigma r. That's our stress, and that will be applied over the area on the top of the element here. So to calculate the area from radian measure, that would be the r, which is r plus dr in this case. So r plus the dr is the outside radius. If we multiply that by the angle, which would be d theta for our element, and then multiply it by the length delta l, we'll get the area of this top surface of our element. So multiplying those terms together, that will give us a force in this direction. That's an upward force, that's a positive force. If we now consider the inside radial stress, that's sigma r, that's down the page. Again, multiplying that by the area, sigma r multiplied by r d theta is the, the length of the inside of this element. Then multiplying by thickness dl, again, that will give us a force, stress times areas of force. Notice it's a negative force because that force is down the page. If we now consider the hoop stress, which is on the side of the element here, 
to work out the force associated with that hoop stress. That will be the stress times the area. So hoop stress multiplied by the area, which will be dr multiplied by dl here. So that's the total force. It's acting in this direction. And what we're interested in calculating is the vertical component of that force, which is going down the page shown here. Well, we use basic trig to calculate this vertical component here. So our force is the stress times the area. And if we multiply that by the sine of the angle, which is a half d theta in this case, we'll calculate this vertical component shown here. So here's the calculation. Notice there are two of them because we've got one either side of our element in the hoop direction. So it's twice times the sigma h times dr times dl times a sine of a half d theta. Notice that's negative because, again, that's down the page. And that should all equal to zero for equilibrium. Note that small angle specified in radians, then sine of half d theta is approximately the same as half d theta, so we can ignore the sine function. That's what's shown on the next line. And if we then divide throughout by dl and d theta, the equation simplifies to this. Sigma r plus d sigma r in a bracket multiplied by r plus dr, that's this term here. We subtract from that the sigma r multiplied by r, shown above. And we subtract from that the sigma h multiplied by dr, because notice that the two cancels with the half. And we're dividing throughout by dl and d theta. So we simply end up with minus sigma h dr. And that equals to zero. The well, next line, I've simply expanded the brackets, multiplied out the brackets. After expanding the brackets, if we now consider the like terms, we'll find that these two terms cancel. That's collecting like terms together. And if we ignore second order terms, this would be a second order term here, a d sigma r times a d theta, one very small value multiplied by another very small value is a negligible value in the calculation here. So that term will also disappear. So we now end up with this expression of sigma r dr added to r d sigma r minus sigma h dr, and that's equal to zero. On the next line, we simply divide this throughout by dr. So we end up with sigma r plus r d sigma r upon dr minus sigma h is equal to zero. Call that equation three. Let's now consider longitudinal stress denoted by sigma l and longitudinal strain denoted by epsilon l. Following our assumptions that the longitudinal stress and the strain are constant across the cylinder walls, we can write the following expression. This is from our previous elastic constants work. Epsilon l can be written as the, the stress in longitudinal direction minus the Poisson effect of the stress in the radial plus the stress in the hoop direction, all divided by e to give us equation four. That's just from elastic constant work for a triaxial stress situation. If we rearrange the equation, sigma r plus sigma h can be shown to equal to negative e multiplied by epsilon l, strain in the l direction, minus the longitudinal stress, all divided by mu, equation 5. Our initial assumptions that the sigma l and epsilon l are constant, as are mechanical material properties, the e and the nu, then sigma r plus sigma h is equal to a constant. For convenience, we'll let that constant equal to 2a. So now sigma r plus sigma h is equal to 2a, or sigma h is equal to 2a minus sigma r, equation 7 here. Proof continued. If we now substitute equation 7 from the previous slide into equation 3, shown here for convenience, we now end up with sigma r plus r d sigma r divided by dr minus, then from equation 7, 2a minus sigma r, still equals to 0. Expanding the bracket on the next line, notice the change of sign here. Also notice we have two sigma r's now, which we can collate. We end up with equation 9. And then if we multiply throughout by negative r, and rearrange, we have an equation 2ar minus r squared d sigma r divided by dr minus 2 multiplied by sigma rr, 
and that's equal to zero. We can now integrate equation 10 with respect to the radius r. Notice that sigma r is a function of r, and also that the r squared d sigma r upon dr is a product, so we're integrating a product. We can end up with the equation a r squared minus sigma r r squared is equal to a constant. I'll show you the integration process on a separate slide. What we'll do on the next slide is let this constant symbol be, and then we'll rearrange for sigma r. Proof of Lama's equations continued. Here's a brief overview of the integration process, endeavouring to show how the final Lama's equations are formed. So from the previous slide, we have to integrate, with respect to the radius r, the following expression. 2ar minus r squared multiplied by d sigma r divided by dr minus 2 sigma r r. So on the next line, we're integrating all three of those terms. On the next line, we're simply taking constants outside the integral. So 2a is a constant, so that's taken outside of the first integral. And then 2 is a constant in the third integral, so that's shown outside the integral. Call that equation 1 in Roman numerals. Proof continued. What we're going to do now is solve the second integral, the integral of r squared multiplied by d sigma r divided by dr with respect to r. This is actually a product and from a previous presentation we know that to integrate a product we use the biparts formula. The biparts formula is shown here. In the biparts formula we have to designate a u and a dv term. So in this case the u is r squared and the dv is a d sigma r divided by dr. Differentiating the u with respect to r becomes 2r, standard form here, r squared is the form of x to the n, differentiating that becomes 2r, and rearranging du is equal to 2r multiplied by dr. Integrating the dv, we have the integral of d sigma r dr with respect to r, the dr in the numerator cancelled with the dr in the denominator. So on the left hand side we're essentially integrating 1 dv and on the right hand side we're essentially integrating 1 d sigma r. Performing the integration v is equal to sigma r. I'm ignoring the constant of integration here and we'll add the constant of integration at the end of the integration process. So we're inserting the values now into our by parts formula, u is r squared, v is sigma r, and du is 2r dr. Again, we're taking a constant 2 outside of the integral here. Call this equation 2 in Roman numerals. Proof continued. We're now substituting equation 2 from the previous slide into equation 1 derived earlier. So this is the equation 2 from the by parts formula on the previous slide. And if we now integrate the first term here, integrating r respect to dr, that becomes r squared upon 2 plus the constant of integration. Expanding the brackets for the second term, we get negative r squared sigma r then positive, double negative, making a positive of 2 integral of sigma r r respect to r, subtract 2 times the integral of sigma r r respect to r. So now we can see some cancelling. The first term, the 2 in the numerator, cancels with the 2 in the denominator. So we have a r squared plus c on the next line. And we can also see that this positive integral here cancels with this negative integral here, the same integrals, opposite sense. So we're left with the second term on the left hand side being the negative r squared sigma r, and that's equal to zero. All that's happened on the next line is I've subtracted the constant c from both sides of the equation, get negative c on the right hand side, and now I'm going to let capital B equals negative c, just replacing one constant symbol for another. So from this integration process, we end up with the equation a r squared minus r squared sigma r is equal to b. Note that both a and b are constants.
the proof continued. So by rearranging the equation on the previous slide, as we said, letting the constant equal to b and dividing throughout by the r squared, we can show that the radial stress is equal to a minus b divided by r squared. So equation 12 is the radial stress equation. If we now substitute equation 12 above into equation 7 derived on our previous slide, here's equation 7, the hoop stress is equal to 2a minus sigma r. So replacing the sigma r with equation 12, we find that sigma h is equal to 2a minus a plus b divided by r squared, and 2a minus a is a. So hoop stress can shown to be equal to a plus b divided by r squared. We call that equation 13 here. So equations 12 and 13 repeated below for convenience are known as Lamez equations, and they describe the radial and hoop stress distribution through the cylinder wall. Constants a and b in the equations are often found by knowing the boundary conditions for the radial stress sigma r at the inside and outside of the cylinder walls. Let's consider thick cylinders subject to internal pressure only, so there's no external pressure in this particular situation. So consider a thick cylinder which only has the internal pressure, Pi, shown here. The external pressure is zero. So for the boundary conditions shown in figure three, the radial stress at the inside radius would be negative the internal pressure, that's it, R is equal to Ri, and the radial stress at the outside of the vessel will be zero, that's when R is equal to R naught, using notation shown here. So the internal pressure is considered a negative radial stress because it tends to produce thinning or compression of the cylinder wall. So substituting these boundary conditions into equation 12 and determine the expressions for constants A and B, it can be shown that for thick cylinders with internal pressure only, this pressure here, that the radial stress at the inside radius is negative the pressure, and the radial stress is zero at the outside radius. If we subtract equations 14 and 15 shown above here, we end up with negative pi is equal to negative b divided by ri squared minus the negative b divided by ro squared. The a's cancel when we subtract these equations. So now simplifying the terms here, we find that negative pi is equal to constant b multiplied by ri squared minus ro squared or divided by ro squared ri squared. Simply rearranging the previous equation for b, we end up with negative pi ro squared multiplied by ri squared or divided by the ri squared minus the ro squared, called that equation 16. We now substitute equation 16 shown above into equation 15 shown here for convenience. We end up with 0 is equal to the a and that's minus the b and the b is this term here from equation 16 above and that's multiplied by 1 upon r naught squared, so 1 upon r naught squared. Rearranging for a we find equation 17. If we now substitute equation 16 from above and equation 17 into equation 12, shown here for convenience, so this is equation 17 from above, this is equation 16 from above. And so by simplifying, we end up with an equation for radial stress at any location r within the vessel wall. That's equation 18. If we now adopt the same approach, for the hoop stress equation, in other words, substitute the A constant and the B constant into Lama's equations for hoop stress, we can derive an equation for hoop stress, again, at any location, R, through the vessel wall, equation 19. As in most of the problems, we're going to consider the maximum values for the 
radial stress and the hoop stress across the section occur at the bore. So we know that the maximum radial stress at the bore is equal and opposite to the pressure, so it's negative P. And knowing that the R in this equation is Ri, then the maximum hoop stress at the bore simplifies to equation 21. Just note, for a cylinder subjected to external pressure only, the radial stress is greatest at the outside surface, and the hoop stress is calculated from equation 22 shown here. Also note for reference, cylinders with external pressure also need to be checked for buckling, but that's outside the scope of this particular presentation. And here's a bibliography used to help generate this presentation. I hope this presentation was of interest to you. I hope you managed to stay awake. And thank you for viewing.